Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, men and women, non-conformers and non-believers, gender X and gender equals, welcome to Eat the Storms, the poetry podcast. My name is Damien B. Donnelly and I am the host and producer of this show and I would like to start by saying a huge thank you to all of you, the listeners, for tuning in here today. Today is a very special episode, like one of those episodes from Friends back in the 90s that appeared every season that was a decoupage of clips of previous episodes. Well today, here on Eat the Storms, it's very similar to that, only it's a decoupage of thank yous. Yesterday, the 17th of September, of course that will depend on when you're listening to this episode, but on the 17th of September 2020, it was the launch of my debut poetry pamphlet, Eat the Storms, published gracefully by the Hedgehog Poetry Press, which was the reason actually for starting this podcast. So yesterday, to celebrate my pamphlet's first birthday, I threw a party over at Zoom, a party of poetry, prose and friends. Perhaps the first of many, as I was old and able to have a certain amount of writers reading their work, but hopefully over time I can repeat this and we can open up the visual platform to more writers. And so that brings me back to today's episode, which is my way of saying thank you to all of the writers who joined last night's show to share their work and make the first birthday of my first poetry pamphlet unforgettable. As I said last night, this has been an extraordinary year of insurmountable losses, incomprehensible distances, along with those strange disappearances of toilet rolls. But what has been incredible has been this community that's built up online, whether that's been on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or in all those fantastic Zoom rooms I've attended. I know there is a whole bucket full of crap out there, but I feel blessed to have dodged it so far. The motto of this podcast is always never pressure, only praise, which hopefully translates into do good, get good. Today I have 19 guests on the show and I am sharing one poem from each guest that they already shared on the podcast over the past three seasons. See why it's like friends now? So please sit down on that sofa and enjoy the show. Eat the Storms, my pamphlet, was all about finding hope in the darkness, catching colour and holding it when the lights go out, learning how not to panic, how to hold on to the memory of a breath so as to place it into that gap later when it feels impossible to breathe. This first poem that I'm sharing with you on the podcast today is called Black is Only Shadow, because even in shadow you can still hold on to the hope of a return to the light. Winter has grey wings. Feathers of soot that come from concrete clouds too dense to discern any light beyond. Winter wears grey wings. But spring is an architect of possibility by a canal of colour sweeping in after the frost to bathe us in a breath of fresh air that blows across a chest once in chain. Round the red-bricked bridge we ride, each pedal pushing past the storms that rained rivers through our winters. Follow the river, she sings. Seasons are short, but the earth is a sphere turning towards the light. Dark doors open often into hopeful. The river recalls its root regardless of the water. Blue can be a bright beacon. Black is only shadow before it finds a reason. To ignite in light. Bark is dry, but branches bear a blossom. We can be the water or the bridge. We can be the natural path or the paved plot. The root is bright beyond the chains, beyond the bend where the colour is waiting.
My first three guests today on the show have three things in common. Their uniqueness, the light they radiate with their smiles and their words, and the fact that I believe they are all stars. First up, we have the Scottish German mother, dog owner and occasional Twitter dancing sensation with appearances in Sledgehammer Lit, Dreek, Anti-Heroin Cheek and many more while currently working on her first chapbook from Berlin that will be Anik Yerem. Then, joining us from the west coast of Ireland, we have a life enthusiast, psychotherapist, singer and writer who's been shortlisted in the Hennessy Literary Awards. Published in various places, including The Honest Ulsterman, The Banker Literary Journal and The Irish Independent, from Hedford in Galway, my soul sister Ashlyn Kio. And then from the West Coast, we move over to the Black Isle and the Scottish Highlands for the author of the recent poetry pamphlet, A Glimmer of Stars, from the Hedgehog Poetry Press. She may go under the Twitter handle Dizzy Lynn, but this lass is far from Dizzy with her first full collection, Life Stink and Honey, coming from the Cinnamon Press in 2022. And she was recently the runner up in the Scots category for the Wigtown Poetry Prize. This will be my favourite Valentine, Lynn Valentine. One, what I know. My daughter has chestnut eyes and seaweed hair. She's five or ten or fifty. I hold whole worlds inside my stitched up head, otters, riddles, my collected lifetimes. Today I woke up singing. So much more that I could do right now, so much less. Two, welthaltig. Sei bedeutend und welthaltig, your everyday goodbye. No real translation, something, someone enfolds the world. When I was young, I held in the palm of my hand the wonders, the heartbreaks, the trees. If I breathe, they could disappear. You don't say it anymore, but I do. I whisper it through the ghost of your beard, through the scars on your scalp. Three, the making. Everyone dies, but not everyone dies, right? Take Chopin, you'll see my fingers trace the music on the grand piano darkening our living room. Wish on blossoms during Sakura season. Look at pictures of me in Kumamoto, drunk and happy, writing Tanaka is crazy on a blackboard. Think of us building shacks on the beach a father-daughter dance of shells and sand and driftwood. I need to remember you. I'm still listening, still here. Look at me. Look at everything I gave you. All the words. I collected all those worlds in the making. <laughs> Storms I weather. In a month where they kept coming and everyone was saying how the land could take no more water, I learned that he could take no more of me. The ore 334 and rain spilled over stone walls and ditches and ran down roads like rivers. Biblical rain and jokes about needing an ark to get around the place and I maybe definitely hoped he would drown, arkless in the bile he spewed. He shot not with the tongue but with the goddamn phone in his hand texted me to say I am ugly and take the moral high ground. Well, somebody has to. I am a do-gooder. Well, better that than evil to the bone. I am a drama queen, though I have walked away without saying a word. He is a weapon of mass destruction, a loose cannon raging tiny wars. Spears pierce my giving heart while he turns deathly cold, his vital organ rotted by the drug cocktail of his everyday indifferent existence. Mine is a ringside seat to the world's slowest death by suicide, by prescription painkillers and anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, whatever he can get his hands on from the dark web, cut with orange strepsils when he goes too high, too far over the edge. And he is over and past the place of being human, and I wish I could murder, almost as much as I wish he'd live on the orange ones. <laughs> Und 
in a Glasgow library, 1987. They borrow six mills and boons at a time, maximum limit, hover at the door, wait while I'm classifying new arrivals. How many books does it take to chip away the grey of the council estate? I stick a small rose on the spines to be filed under romance, no symbol for sex so the harlequins nuzzle suggestively next to tales of love and heroines. The Zane Greys and the like are filed with the sign of a gun. I'd prefer a horse, if I'm honest, likewise with daggers for crime, a swap for the O of a magnifying glass. This estate is commonplace for knives, the odd gun, the odd death, hard men, violence, Thatcher sucking it dry. I'm grateful to those who order new roses, happy for those who travel with horses. I hope you can now see how great the birthday celebrations last night really were. For my next three guests, I am delighted to welcome one of my first darlings, muses and supporters on WordPress, where we both have blogs. A Devon girl surrounded by mud and apple orchards, but with her heart firmly placed in the Guinness and the gluttony of Ireland. She is a regular swimmer, reader and host of Diverse Poets with sparkling appearances in Black Bow, Spelt and Hencroft Tub. This will be the incredible Sarah Connor. After Sarah, we have a guest who is no stranger to hosting Spoken Words events as she is the co-creator and wonderful host of Dragonfly Spoken Word, which was once in Brighton and is now global. She has a master's in creative writing from the University of Brighton and writes poetry, prose, and is currently working on a novel which will be semi-autobiographical, magical realism. Joining us from Sussex, this is the Dragonfly with less t-shirts than her co-host, Barbara Mercer. And finally, after Barbara, we will have our first gentleman of this episode, aside from little old me, of course, who keeps us up to date with what to read with his Saboteur Awards nominated weekly review series on WordPress, while four of his collections have been published by the Hedgehog Poetry Press, including the exceptional Psychopathogen. And coming soon to your bookshelf, please make room, is his latest collection of poetry, Unmuted. It is an honour to hand you over to the member of the Open University Poetry Society, Nigel Kent. This poem is called Renewal. Listen, avoid me. I'm the mad woman on the bus. Cassandra in a pair of boots. I'll be the one grabbing you and gabbling. Listen, you can't fight nature. She's wily and she's wise. She shapeshifts so that you think you've caught her but she slips away. First fish, then fox, then waterfall, then weasel. Listen, I tell you. There are fish that sleep for years in the dark mud beds waiting for rain. And I've seen green shoots punching through the charcoaled earth, demanding life. And roots hold wisdom and share knowledge. Listen, I saw some primroses today, pale shreds of hope. And my feet found an old familiar rhythm, though my muscles moaned. And the great beauty of these winter days, cut short by the earth's slow rolling round, is that you're there to see the sunrise. The cold-hearted bastard stirs and mumbles in his sleep, restlessly twisting his limbs in crisp white linen. His dreams seem all the same lately. Endless corridors, Locked doors, misted windows rendering him blind. He feels heavy, weighed down, doped by a pleasant warmth, a languor unlike him. He feels no urgency, no sharp bite of anticipation. He has a job to do somewhere, some time. Must shake Lucy's shackles, drive out this numbing balm. Damn it! He's the god of frost. He drives icicles through the world's heart and hardens the earth, turns sea solid, takes a firm hand with glaciers, 
tends to avalanches. He's an artist with snowflakes, a murderer with chill. His is the fish visible, static and frozen in lake ice. His, the crunch of footsteps on a cold day given. His, the hunt across the frozen waste. He raises his mighty fist, glass rhymes and cracks. He gets out, this time. I wrote this poem in response to the official government guidance to employers, which states that they should take every possible step to facilitate employees working from home. You are through to the office of mum and dad. Unfortunately, all our direct lines are busy right now. Current wait time is approximately 60 minutes. For an automated response to your query, Press 1 for menu and meal times. Press 2 for help with home lessons. Press 3 for entertainment restrictions. Press 4 for advice about difficulties with siblings. Press 5 if you have a fever and a cough. For all other inquiries, press 6. Leave your name and number and we'll ring back when available. Thanks for calling the office of Mum and Dad where parenting is our priority. For the latest family news and events, including arrangements for Grandad's funeral, check our Facebook page. Thank you so much, Nigel. And a reminder that you can find details of all of my guests on the website www.eatthestorms.com. Head over there, click on the podcast section, and there you will find a listing of all the episodes. This was episode 11, season 3. There you will find links on how to follow everybody and even where to buy their books like Nigel's Psychopathogen or his upcoming Unmuted. Next up, we are staying in the UK for a poet, mentor, journalist and presenter who I will be forever grateful to as she was my mentor this summer on my upcoming first full collection, who guided me from a single note to a completed orchestration. And my goodness, what a class act she is. With six collections, including Ghosting for Beginners, Kissing the She-Bear and the recent Fever View from Indigo Dreams, this is the executive director of the Cheltenham Poetry Festival, Anna Saunders. Following Anna, we have the author of the chapbook Quicksand, published by Dreek and Balancing Act, the Stickleback Micro Collection recently published by the Hedgehog Poetry Press. We know and love her as the writing warrior fighting her way through multiple sclerosis. That will be Julie Stevens. And then after Julie, we jump north and head specifically to the southeast coast of Scotland for a poet and artist who loves jumping into the sea and walking dogs. She is the author of Broken Things and Other Tales that had its first anniversary earlier this year and I was delighted to be a part of that glorious, cosy, creative event. With work in Fevers of the Mind, Miss Lexia, Wild Goose Publications and the recent winner of the Hedgehog Poetry Press's annual Cupid Arrow competition, this is the fantastic Vicky Allen. My book Ghosting for Beginners is all about the things that haunt us. And of course, we can be haunted by the people we have lost and memories of them. This poem was written about one of the last walks I went on with my wonderful father. We heard a robin singing in the gloaming. And it's interesting, these robins always sing darker, sing more strongly as the dark descends, which I thought was a wonderful metaphor for the resilience of the human spirit. The Song The ivy is lustrous with rain, the path beneath us a morass of mud and leaf. My father's voice trembles with joy. You talk too much, my mother says, wraps his emerald smart scarf around his mouth to stop the cold reaching his heart. His eyes, bright green as algae and flooded through with light, 
beam above a muffled smile. Was it then we heard the robin singing from the heart of a tree? Soft rain spluttering on leaf, twilight deepening in the woods, the bird's song becoming bolder as the night fell. Returning alone, I can hardly bear to listen to that bluster, to the urgent song of a creature asserting its claim on a darkening earth. If I can't. If I can't walk that fast, then I'll start a new race. If I can't keep my balance, then I'll sing as I sway. If I can't use my hand, then I'll learn a new trick. If I get so very tired, then I'll run in my sleep. If the heat is too much, then I'll wave at the sun. If I forget the answer, then I'll find a new question. If I can't sleep at night, then I'll say good morning to the stars. This poem is called Night. I need the night, blessing and balm of the softening sky, as the day folds its hands, finished. The soothing weight across scratchy eyes, a mother's hand resting, sound still to reverent hush. Velvety animal black, with trails of stars summoning silence. Moon cycles moving heaven and earth to bring sleep. I need the night, long, dream-hazed, quiet. How else to welcome another dawn? Thank you so much, Vicky. I think that's going to be my bedtime treat to listen to from now on. Though not just yet, because tonight we still have nine more guests to share with you on the show. I know, I'm really spoiling you. My next guest is almost as famous for her baking as she is for her poetry. Baking which she does with her wife to enjoy tea with a seemingly well-known poetry podcast which drops every Saturday. This next guest is very fond of peculiar things the scent of ice cream freezers and magnifying glasses. Magnifying glass being the name of her debut collection published by Black Eyes Publishing in 2020. That will be Sue Finch. From Sue, whose first poem she shared on the podcast was The Hair, we move on to Mr. Hare, a writer who always brings the unexpected to his work. Based in Herefordshire, with work in Ice Flow, Dreek, Orside and Black Bow Poetry, and even a poetry garden along the Rhine, this will be Roger Hare. And following Roger will be my partner in poetry, as we have a pamphlet recently co-written, coming out soon from the Henshaw Poetry Press, called In the Jitterfritz of Neil. She works in social care and thankfully for me knows all the best places in Dublin to dine. We'd work in Ink, Sweat and Tears, the Stony Thursday book and the Bangor Literary Journal. I give you Eileen de Puer. The Red Shoes Never danced with a boy. Wanted to. Couldn't flirt and risk the invitation. No rhythm, no chance. I imagined the Red Shoes would do the trick. Too impatient to save, twelve weeks and eternity to me, I distracted him, the Saturday boy, whose hands fumbled for bags, whose fingers mishit the keys of the cash register. He struggled to fetch the next pair, and the next, as I feigned tightness in the width, a squashed left little toe, my desire for a heel, a want for a bow. The scarlet pair hugged my feet, I felt the urge to stand and jig, my stomach flipped, 
I had to swallow a smile. I like these, I told him, but wonder, would black be more appropriate? He withheld a sigh and readied himself for the ladder. Top shelf, he mumbled as he stood to fetch them. Halfway up the ladder, I laughed and left, had to grip my belly to hold myself together as the chuckles came and came. My feet spent their energy, a jig, a reel, a reel, a jig. I danced, smiling at my new beat. I roared as I polkered, my lungs grabbed for air, reeling, reeling. I could not find the oxygen within my breaths. The woodcutter smiled to see me, leaned back to enjoy the one-woman show. No, 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 I panted in horror. It's the shoes. He stepped behind me resorting to an imitation of my steps to keep time. I wanted to laugh at the big booted feet dancing with me, cartooning each step, caring enough not to step on the hated shoes. I could only weep. He held me. I trembled the rhythm of my legs, offered him one foot, one shoe. He gripped, yet his giant hands could not master the vice-like leather. He pushed my shoulders away in horror. I danced to his axe, shocked him sick when I struck. One foot, two feet, no feet. I want to be. I want to be a glass of wine. Not the glass, but the wine. Divine and slightly more viscous than water. Not the wine, but the grapes, engorged berries, tight with promise. Not the grapes, but the pedicel stems that strain to contain the loaded flesh. Not the stems, but the vine itself, all wise and old, bearing growth with distinction and poise. Not the vine, but the soil that holds the history of warm seas, Stratification, uplift and erosion, full of mineral goodness, the kind that old men like to lift with their hands, slowly grind and let drain from their fingers. Not the soil, but the rain that damps it at just the right time, in just the right amount. Oh, to be just right. Not the rain, but the clouds that breathe in over oceans and lakes and seas to pocket the water in bundles. Not the clouds, but the sun that makes them, belting out a blast of rays fatal to some. Not the sun, but the space it shines into, containing everything that responded to the divine command, let there be. Not the space we can see, but the entire cosmos, with its melodies and harmonies only angels can hear. Not the cosmos, but the wine in a glass. Don't rush. Delay the gratification. Postcard Pink the sea I see, my love, is smudged with powder pink. Boats pool in saccharine silt, no tide mark ring, a sponge has smoothed out every streak. This light's a warm thing, bay. It brews and simmers, cures and coats. Legs are fine and polished here, arms are lean and glossed. I passed a young girl earlier, towel flapping round her neck, Hola, she said. I have a coat. We both knew she meant cape. The air is thick out here, my sweet, with viscous treacle drops. I catch some on my waiting lips and taste them with my tongue. Eileen, 
Moving now back across the Irish Sea for a poet who enjoys looking into the black bits of life to see how they can make them shine. Recently inducted into I Am, the Hall of Audio fame, she's had work in Dreep, Abridged and South Child Lit and is currently working with the Museum of Loss and Renewal Publishing on her first full collection. This will be Giovanna McKenna. After Giovanna, we slip back to Ireland for a sailor, poet and journalist with roots in County Mayo, but now home in Cove in County Cork, who kept me going last year through Covid with his creative five word poetry prompts from Cove readers and writers. He has been published in many journals, including the Bangor Literary Journal, the Boston Globe, Black Bow and a new Ulster. And soon you will hear why. That will be Rory Debarra. And then from the deepest scent, we are making our way up north for the first of our gorgeous Northern Ireland guests today. Another fellow Hedgehog Poetry Press poet whose recent pamphlet was co-written with Gaynor Kane called End In and thankfully she'll be returning to our bookshelves shortly again as she's working on her first solo pamphlet which will also be coming from the Hedgehog Poetry Press later this year. Her current activities are words and cats because sometimes they hide, reappearing unexpectedly, sometimes they scratch and sometimes they purr. This will be a joy to share with you the words and purrings of Karen Mooney. I'd like to share with you something I wrote um, a few months ago and it's about those days when sometimes the simplest things are the hardest and the most important to celebrate. It was first published in the Speculative Book 2021 and it's called Bravery in the Morning's Light. There are often days in my months, my years, which fail to begin or end. Waking occurs but brings no clarity, only my thoughts, piled high, pushing on my sternum, pressing me further into the mattress, leaving me breathless in the morning's light. There is faint transition, a fractional switch of state, eyes off, eyes on, but little other alters except expectations. Now it is day and there must be action for limbs which in the night have rumpled into rusted anchors. The path to the bathroom is long and possibly impossible. I open eyelids which ache to close, to slip once more into inertia. With one brave foot I test the air for daggers. Empty was uh, featured in the first edition of the Bangor Literary Journal and then I went on to submit it to uh, Poetry Jukebox, the project run by uh, the fabulous poet Maria McManus and it became part of the Hungering cu Curation which was on display outside the Epic Museum in uh, Dublin. That was curated by Maria McManus and the uh, wonderful Jessica Trainer. and I'm very pleased to say that actually that uh, today maybe or tomorrow it actually goes on uh, feature in Poetry Jukebox in Paris, uh, which is uh, extra special. So MT is self-explanatory. And unfortunately, when you're dealing with a humanitarian rescue, a lot of the themes are quite strong because um, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing um, is quite tough. So here we go. Empty. If only the innocent could be kept afloat by faith until the rescuers come walking on the waves to carry the children to the cradle of their mother, not let them tumble in the surf, greeting the morning with their backs, silent and stiff, the red shirt on the tiny frame, a plague on the most twisted ideologies, that poverty is the wrath of God upon the unworthy, destiny a blissful eternity for wanton slaughter, that charity is still valid when you have to bow, tide this mansion profit for your redemption, Change your name to accept a bowl of soup. Washing the feet of a four-year-old, with water warmed by the omnipotent sun overhead, her flawless ebony skin burnt white, stripped by the chemical burn from the bilge, her mother thanking you relentlessly, in three languages invoking empty prayers. I have seen no God in the ocean, no belief in a deity almighty, which allows such cruelty to exist. A capricious torturer demanding worship, 
while the poor try to live off dogma and bread or life jackets would be better. A fond farewell. Stand easy, Dad. This shift is over. Salute. Left turn. Fall out. Now the time has come for another roll. Let there be no doubt that your gentle squeeze of my hand offered to comfort you in your own way, reassured to spell the future out. Not a man of words for the family, yet speech is never phased. Formality, authority, a presence that left many so amazed with signals, a stance, a look, sometimes a furrowed brow. Commanding our attention, even in death, you somehow summoned the strength to say everything. No words got in the way. Piercing looks, intense, a smile over another's shoulder, a wink, that sense of mischief ever present, knowing precisely what I would think. Once a bear of a man, such stature, physical strength now leached by death. Yet the character remains, honed, even mellowed with each lessening breath. A lifetime of avoiding intimacy, yet you seem to crave my touch, or perhaps knowing that I needed yours, that I was trying to be brave. That promised final drink, well, I closed the door, placed that stout soaked sponge to your lips, Saluted you with the tin, then raised it to my own. The look on your face was priceless, as you sucked that sponge like a child, eyes gleaming, smiling. A temporary release from a living hell. Knowing that you were going home, blind eyes were turned, no one would tell. But word got out. Staff cheered internally at our final act of defiance. Boy, you raised me well. We talked. Well, I did. You listened. Covered all the bases. And you, content that all would be well, turned your mind to other places. Restful. Peaceful. Stepping back from duty yet still willfully displaying that even in death, there's beauty. What an incredible farewell there from Karen Mooney to her father, who is the author of Penned In with Gaynor Kane. And as I said, we'll soon have her own pamphlets coming from the Hedgehog Poetry Press, so make room on your bookshelves. My next guest was living in the USA when I was first blown away by their readings of poems from their first full collection, We Know Each Other by Our Wounds, published by Animal Heart Press. They are now living back in the United Kingdom and last weekend gave us an early Christmas gift when their log warming micro poem was one of the finalists in the Black Bow Micro Poetry Christmas Winter Competition that I was fortunate enough to be a judge of. I am delighted to welcome back to the podcast Jude Marr. Following Jude, we have the second half of the Flight of the Dragonflies spoken word creators. This time, the t-shirt obsessed lover of punk music, hair dye and a decent drink at a live event, who is also the author of two pamphlets, Honeydew and the Machinery of Life, and his first full collection will be with us later this year. Having already appeared in 17 anthologies and journals, it was a busy week for him as it was also his birthday. So a very happy birthday to my next guest, Darren J. Beanie. And finally in this trio, I am blessed to know this incredible spoken word performer from Northern Ireland who melted everybody's hearts when she first appeared on Eat the Storms podcast last year. She is the cancer nurse, counsellor, and one of the greatest supporters you'll ever meet. No stranger to being published on anthologies, performing at festivals, on television and radio, this is the incomparable soul, 
Spirit and Survivor. That is Cathy Carson. Candles are always dangerous. The smallest spark is potential conflagration. But when the power goes out, I strike a match. A candle gives off enough light to let a person feel they still exist. A cigarette can be a celebration if you spray it with glitter. Smoking a cigarette for company, I make a matchstick forest burying ends in sand. My last candle has melted. I am not spent yet. There is enough friction in me to start a small fire. I'm not an arsonist, only a seeker after light. I stay in my sandbox because sand puts out fire. Sand also holds back flood. In the theater of my room, shadows are more real than mysterious. Am I actor or audience? If I spray glitter on my skin, does that make me complicit? I sleep head to toe with my charred remains. The smell of sulfur surrounds us and keeps us safe. I light my last cigarette with a resurrected match. What day is this? The smell of sulfur is all that remains. You have worked your wine glass so hard it is now exhausted. You cast it aside. The twinkle in your eye has a knowing look of sage about it, visibly cosy. You grin. You lean my way, littering my ear with a litany of frivolously pinpointed words hinting that you desire a steamy night. You indulge by opening a new bottle, waving a whiff of seduction under my nose, and in a slowly sloshed manner, pour yourself a long, relaxing bubble bath. You enthusiastically abandon your clothes and pencil in a rendezvous with me in an hour, perhaps two, as you sashay serenely into radox indigo evanescence, you let your smooth skin soak away, welcoming ripples and crinkles that wash over you, leaving behind a newly laundered corrugated complexion. And when you have had your fill of humidity, dampness, of being so moist, can take no more of the wetness, can no longer be bothered with the lava, you resurface for the encore, turning out an enticing entrance in a flourish of tantalising toweling, drip, drip, dripping on the parquet floor, each drip reflecting you and your nighttime radiance. To cap things off, we share a special brew. Hooray for Horlicks! Bravo for bed! I anticipate page turning passion, but you are snoring with all of your heart before the first line is even uttered. I am sorry in capitals, in neon lights, in aeroplanes that write the letters in the sky. I am sorry. For the armour I wore in the beginning, you see, it kept me safe in a home full of hurt, but for you it made me unreachable. For the kindness I weaponized, hurled back at you, because when I tried to hold it, it turned to glass in my hands. For every argument I orchestrated, calculated, manipulated, because I was unravelling and I just needed to feel in control of something. For the pull back, push away, in, out, on, off, chaos, confusion I caused in your mind. Trying to find what would make you snap, because I needed to know what that looked like. For the shame I made you feel when you showed me. For behaving in ways that made me as unlovable as I felt, so I could feel like my outside matched my inside. 
for trying to bring you to a place of pain just so that I wouldn't feel so alone in mine. For not understanding that all this anger came from needs not met and that all that I ever had to do with you was ask. I am thankful for arms that are always open for the 22 year old you who kissed me in the top of my head, told me that the war I was waging was nothing to do with you, that you loved me and that you would phone me in the morning and you were right. For patience and persistence, kindness and compassion, never earned but given without condition. For the times you hold me so tight, all my broken parts fuse back together. For the times I almost walked away, but I stayed, because that tug towards you was more powerful than I could ever be. For the times I wake with bed head hair and the sleep I haven't had inked under my eyes and you look at me and tell me I am beautiful. For the perfect predictability of you that drove me crazy in the beginning. For the way you pulled me kicking and screaming from the water. You see, I thought I was swimming, but you could see I was drowning. For that place, just below your left collarbone. Where if I press my ear, hear the thump of your heart and slow my breath so that my thump synchronizes with your thump. Something about that will always, always still me. I am thankful in capitals, in neon lights, in aeroplanes that write the letters in the sky. I am thankful. Okay, we are now running down the list of entertainers on the show today and have just two left. First up, we are heading over to Wales for the man who has made Tuesday not only top, but a real tweet on Twitter with the hashtag Top Tweet Tuesday, which has seen poets go from acquaintances to a firm concrete community. He is the creator of Black Bow Poetry and also the author of Origins 21 Poems with work everywhere from Ice Flow Press to The Lonely Crowd and Green Ink. This will be the MC himself, Mr. Matthew M.C. Smith. And finally, my last guest on the show today was actually my very first guest on the podcast way back in Season 1, Episode 2. The lady who has fallen down in my company more times than anybody else, although thankfully it was actually only the cover of her Venus in Pink Marble first full collection that fell down. Feel free to check out the bloopers for their launch show on YouTube. A fellow hedgehog poet, she is also the author of the pamphlet Memory Forest and a Stickleback Micro Collection. This is the Belfast-born tiara-wearing legend that is Gaynor Kane. Survivor by Matthew M.C. Smith. The rose glass city is bathed in gold light. I cross its thresholds as matter, machine. The labyrinth has fifty floors. I float down flights, take passages through light. What a thing it is to be so alone. Each journey is a torn map, a glitch in the program. I fly across flecked seas. In the ice field I am beached, moraine, tundra, before the glacier. Enter the fire blue cave. Bridge, a construction spanning a divide, supporting the ends, an arch, a connection. For Michael, 21 years ago, we stood at the edge of Devil's Bridge, on the edge of the Atlantic, at the edge of Antigua, with nothing between there 
and Europe accept enormity of marriage and sea. The rocks, the vast ocean in iron grey, dark blue and violet tones of iolite. Water sapphire, gemstone which symbolises our time together. The Vikings compass. They first used slivers as polarising filters to navigate the seas. We stood still. Hand in hand, listening to crashing waves under the underside of the arch. Watching water whistle through blowholes, we felt salt on our skin. Hand in hand, we'd made a pact. We knew we were jumping off the edge together into a life where everything would be all right if we just held each other, if we just held each other's hand. There will be time, there will be time for more, there will be time for more trips to the edge, time for more bridges, for more pacts. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, men and women, non-conformers and non-believers, gender X and gender equals, we've reached the end of another episode of Eat the Storms, the poetry podcast. My name is Damien B. Donnelly and I'm the host and producer of this show and I'd like to say thank you so much to you for joining us here today, whether that's been on Spotify, Anchor, Apple, Google, Breaker, Podbean, Player FM, Radio, Public, Overcast, Castbox, Pocket Cast or iTunes. My guests today have been Anik Yerum, Ashlyn Kyo, Lynn Valentine, Sarah Connor, Barbara Mercer, Nigel Kent, Julie Stevens, Vicky Allen, Sue Finch, Roger Hare, Giovanna McKenna, Rory DeBarra, Karen Mooney, Eileen DePuer, Jude Marr, Darren J. Beanie, Kathy Carson, Matthew M.C. Smith, and Gaynor Kane. As I said during the podcast, for details of all of my guests, please head on over to www.8thestorms.com. Click on the podcast section and there you'll find a listing for every episode. This was episode 11, season 3. We will be back with you again next week for a new episode with new guests. So if you'd like to be one of those guests, then please drop me an email at eatthestorms at yahoo.com. We have four episodes left for season 3 and then we'll take a break, but we'll be back with you again for winter. So for me, for now, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining me here today to help me celebrate the first birthday of my poetry pamphlet, Eat the Storms. Thank you to all of my guests. This is my poem, Eat the Storms. Eat the storms, mother said. Boil these beds of bitter blackness until the dream rips through the rain and translucent turns to trust. Even a diamond must ache in that darkness until compression can no longer conceal. Eat the storms, mother said. Slip out of shivering skin until touch recalls that sweet music of scarlet rising. Caught Below the lick of leaf, lost in the shadow of the shade. Even the petal must rise above the thorn before it can dance in the light. Eat the storms, mother said, but I didn't hear it at first. It takes time to swallow the truth. And teach the tongue to taste that rain. Thank you, everybody. And now remember, till next time, stay.